All right. Let's call this meeting to order. Let's pray. Lord, what a day. Uh, we, we're in, the, in, a, in a fresh weathered day. Uh, I saw 59 degrees last night on my phone as getting ready for bed. I love the change. Uh, but I also love that after a season of rain, when the sun comes out. And so we thank you, Lord, not only for the seasons, but the transitions between them. May the crispness and the coolness out today do something deep within us. May it provide a, a, a sense of, of transformation and change and power, uh, that we be excited. We pray as well that the Word of God would be proclaimed in this room and shared and thrown out in this room into hearts and beyond uh, using uh, technology we have, people online. We pray the Bible would, uh, your authorized tool would be leaned upon. We pray that our hearts, which are washed in the blood of Jesus and designed to receive the Word of God, uh, upon which, like the altar, the ark, where you would appear before the priests in the temple, may you appear upon our hearts because the Word of God, your Word, dwells there as well as your Son's blood. We pray in the name of Jesus that we would have an encounter with you today. We pray that others would be able to be blessed by what happens in this room. And we pray that your church would be built and edified and your glory would be seen. We pray this, Father, in the mighty name, the authorized name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, hello. hello. I missed y'all last week. I got to see uh, Ben Todd's teaching, which was amazing and excellent. I keep leaning on Ben. I'm trying to get him to be here more often. He's kind of torn between two churches right now, and uh, he's a great asset. He's a Disciples of Christ person, but he's a weird one like me. I, when I first met Doug Skinner at a meeting, in between, he heard some of my remarks were more orthodox than most most of our colleagues, and he just leaned in and said, "Paul, were you raised in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ?" I said, "Mm-hmm." How did you happen? <laughs> and and that's that's how I feel about Ben Todd. Like, yeah. Yeah. you know, how how did how did you happen? And he's just a, such an asset. And hopefully what we heard, um, not only was the sovereign power of the gospel, the only gospel has the power to change lives, but uh, on the negative side, just because something has be de been determined to be a heresy doesn't mean that killed it. When something's determined to be a heresy, a lot of times we're like, well, that's been handled. We need to be prepared to recognize that just because something's labeled wrong doesn't mean it ends up being impotent. It still has the power to lure people away from the real gospel of Jesus Christ. But instead of cursing the darkness, we bring the light. Instead of cursing Pelagianism, we preach the gospel. And as Ben said last week, once you know the truth, then you can spot the lie. And uh, so today we'll be talking about the gospel, because that's what we do every time we're together. Uh, I've been, um, I spent some time on, on a trip, uh, literally had a mountaintop experience, and uh, a few things th that I've got, I've been hearing a lot from the Word of God. I've been repenting a lot, which means being a, uh, encountered of truth and then adjusting to that truth. It doesn't mean you're in trouble. It's, it's joy-based repentance, that God is going to draw you into His, His room, His counsel, and then say, be prepared to be wrong, incomplete. And uh, one of the things He shared with me, I'll share some others as we teach today. He shared with me that I needed the church to be praying for me. And I know the church does pray. Um, we pray for all sorts of things. But in particular, uh, God lifted up three people in, in a mighty way. In fact, they came to me. And they didn't know I had this foreknowledge of this, going, this was going to happen. And the three things in the three different people, and I'd encourage you to pray for these three things. I'm going to be praying for, number one, my safety and the safety of my family. Uh, number two is 
uh, for me to continue to hear from God and repent, um, you're going to want your pastor to be a repentant man. Um, and number three, um, that, that what takes place would be effective. Uh, that, that the preaching of the gospel would be effective. Uh, the teaching of God's word would be effective. Now, of course, that's not a prayer just for me. But we shouldn't expect those three things, protection, hearing from the Lord and repenting, and being effective in the Word of God, we shouldn't expect that for the masses unless the preacher is also experiencing these things. So this is kind of a trickle-down prayer for the church. But those are real sharp things to be praying for. Uh, we trust that God is good at what He does. And uh, any, any uh, frustration or concern on the other side is more deception than reality. And so I've been uh, told to seek these people to pray for me so that I'm not deceived um, and that I would continue to preach from the Bible, continue to preach the Holy Word of God. Let's do just that. Let's open up Isaiah 41 and trust that even the reading of Scripture in this space is blessing this space, moving mountains and convicting hearts. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let, them, let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up the one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, Yahweh, with the first of them and with the last, I am He. The islands have seen it in fear. The ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward. Each helps the other and says to his brother, Be strong. The craftsman encourages the goldsmith, and he who smooths with the hammer spurs on him, spurs on him who strikes the anvil. He says of the welding, It is good. And he nails down the, the idol so that it will not topple. But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, my beloved, I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing of all, at all. For I am Yahweh, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. I will help you. Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob, O little Israel. For I myself will help you, declares the Lord Yahweh, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a thresh threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. You will thresh the mountains and crush them and reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them. The wind will pick them up and a gale will blow them away. But you will rejoice in Yahweh and glory in the Holy One of Israel. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, Yahweh, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia the myrtle and the olive. I will set pines in the wasteland and fir and cypress together so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of Yahweh has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Bring in your idols. Tell us what is going to happen. Tell us the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know that you are God's. Do something, whether good or bad, so that we may be dismayed and filled with fear. But you are less than nothing. 
and your works are utterly worthless. And he who chooses you is detestable. I have stirred up the one from the north, and he comes. One from the rising sun who calls on my name. He treads on rulers as if they were mortar, as if he were a potter treading the clay, who told of this from the beginning so that we can know, or beforehand so that we could say he was right. No one told of this. No one foretold it. No one heard any words from you. This was the fir- I was the first to tell Zion, look, here they are. I gave to Jerusalem a messenger of good tidings. I took, I, uh, I look, but there is no one. No one among them to give counsel. No one to give an answer when I ask them. See, they are all false. Their deeds amount to nothing. Their images are but wind and confusion. The word of the Lord. On your notes, first blank. This is a Mount Carmel moment. The prophets of Baal, the prophets, the prophet of Yahweh, gathered up. And the the I love the beginning. Elijah's filled with a sermon. The best sermons are the ones just after or just before a demonstration of God's power. And Elijah was filled with a sermon, and he said, "No longer should we Israel limp along as a nation with two opinions." If Yahweh be God, let us follow Him. If Baal be God, let us follow Him. A similar in Revelation, uh, you are neither hot nor cold. I spew you out of my mouth. And it's this, a Mount Carmel moment, a judgment moment, where God, God is now speaking for Himself. He's not speaking uh, through Elijah. He's writing through Isaiah, but it's, it, Isaiah is not using first-person language. He's using God language. God is having his own, uh, a second version of a Mount Carmel moment. But in this case, it's not about who's going to rule Israel. It's about who's going to rule the entire earth. So that's what this is about. So when it, it kind of gets mixed up on what he's talking about, who he's referring to, it's important to know he's, this is a time of judgment. On your notes, uh, God judges... All see the verdict, and then God offers a sentence slash decision. So the first thing God judges, all see the verdict, and then God offers a sentence slash decision. For God's soul of the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Son of Man did not enter the world, what? To condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Condemned in Greek means to make decisions. Jesus is saying, as we'll see elsewhere, this is the pattern, the pattern that's built in the Old Testament is echoing a global pattern that's going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus, when He came, He said, like the serpent lifted on the pole in the wilderness, I didn't come to give advice, I didn't come to make decisions, I am the decision. So, three things happen. God judges, God produces a verdict, and then God puts out a sentence. And so, globally, when Jesus came, uh, the Father uh, judged, and what did He see? This uh, This is what God saw, light, well, God saw darkness. That's what He saw. Right? So He's judging it, He sees utter darkness. Every time he says, here's the verdict, light has come into the world, but men loved the darkness. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light. So God is is making it clear, okay, I've judged the earth. Every time light enters the world, 
the verdict is men stand guilty. They always prefer darkness over light. That's the verdict. Um, we'll see a verdict in a minute about the idols. God judges the idols. The verdict are, he's, he, to judge doesn't mean innocent or guilty. Sometimes it means what is the truth. And the truth here is idols are worthless. That's his judgment on the idols. You're worthless. Uh, if someone's done a criminal activity, they're trying to find out, did you do it or did you not do it? But God's judgments can be up, down, left, right, any, anything. And he's judging idols in John 3. He's judging the earth. And he says the earth is a place that prefers darkness over light. Not nine times out of ten, not 99 times out of 100, but 100 times out of 100. Apart from grace, apart from redemption, apart from God's sovereign election, the human race is utterly fallen. None may boast. All have fallen short of the glory of God. So that's the verdict and the decision, the sentence is Jesus. You see. So you see that pattern early on in the Old Testament. You see it way before Isaiah as well. That God judges something, He calls it like it is, and then He provides an answer, a decision. And sometimes His decisions are, uh, from our perspective, um, uh, wrathful. And sometimes they're from our perspective uh, merciful, but from God's perspective they're glorifying. That at the end of the day, people would say, it was by the Lord. The Lord did this. The Lord is real. You might not like Him. Every knee will bend, every tongue confess, some with smiles and some with, through clenched teeth. Pharaoh knew by the end of the process that the God of Moses was real. Did he love him? Pharaoh was an object of wrath, and so his experience of God was not one of, of, of puppy dogs and, and, and sunshine, but it was definitely one of God's real. I was dashed upon him, I was dashed upon the rocks, but the rocks are real. Some of us live upon the rocks, and we say the rocks are real. And so that's what we have in Isaiah chapter 41. That's why it starts off with, what's the first two words? Be silent. This is a time of judgment. We don't need to hear anything else. I've been watching for a long time. Let me enter my own counsel, and then let me decide. Uh, the next line, beginning with verse 2 on your notes... Uh, he talks about a, someone uh, rising up from the east, Cyrus of Persia. Is and it says two things: is roused, and this is going to be tight. I've got a few words to say: and elected for God's righteous purposes. In Isaiah 45, I believe, we see that Cyrus called upon the name of the Lord, but didn't acknowledge the Lord. And it makes a real clear distinction. We'll study that in Isaiah 45. So this doesn't mean Isaiah's, or uh, Cyrus is elected for salvation. It means he's elected, at the very least we can say he was elected by God for God's righteous purposes. As I've mentioned before, just because someone's used by God... I'm just going to leave that there. I'm going to let you finish that sentence. How many times do people, preachers, live a life of secret sin, unrepentant, boastful before the Lord? God uses them. They say, well, as long as God's still using me and all these people are coming to Christ, I can continue to live in this sin. Am I right? Yeah. It's careful. What does it profit a man? To gain the whole world. Amen. Okay. Uh, it says uh, two things. Uh, he, who has stirred up the one from the east? It's rhetorical. I have stirred the one from the east, says the Lord, calling him into righteousness to God's service. Uh, God hands over to him and subdues kings before him. So on your notes... Yahweh gives or hands nations 
and reign to Cyrus. Verse 3 uh, has an interesting line in Hebrew. It's, it really caught my eyes. Uh, he pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. And it just popped out to me when I was reading, so I started to study it. And what we see in Isaiah 41.3 on your notes, this was neither Cyrus's will nor his former experience. There's a, God can do what God does. Anything He wants to do, God's free to do and able to do. And what we see earlier in Isaiah was through the Assyrians, God removed His hand from Israel and allowed Assyria to do what they've always wanted to do, which is to dominate Israel. God didn't rouse them up. They, just, they were already chomping at the bit. God stopped protecting Israel, allowed the lust of Assyria. Lust just means, I take for me from you. That's why lust shouldn't even be in the marital bed, by the way. People, I, I love the, the old American ba the, Baptist, but American uh, Christian thing that says, lust is bad, so save it for your marriage. <laughs> I mean, come on. Who said that? Well, it's just it's assumed. And Jesus says lust is bad, period. Uh, never should you be in a... Uh, I heard recently on uh, uh, our college ministries looking at the topic of sex. That's all they ever look at, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was, let us, let us be guided by our spirit into a sexual expression rather than being led by our sexuality into a, and have our spirit tag along. You see? And so, a lot of times, uh, you know, our sexual encounters, even in the marriage bed, is based on a man taking from a woman. It's just done under the covert nature of a marriage, so we don't think of it as a bad thing. But, we see Assyria had lust, had the need to take from other nations, and so God just let them have what they wanted. This is different because Persia, according to this scripture, was roused by God and led through a pathway they wouldn't have otherwise gone. And so we see up front that God's dealings with the king of Persia, Cyrus, is going to be different than God's dealings with the king of Assyria. It's two different, two different types of elections for God's righteous purposes. And we also see that Cyrus was a little gentler and more gracious to the people of God. Verse 4 uh, on your notes, uh, Yahweh points out, while, while Cyrus is handed nations and reign, uh, this is what God says, Yahweh is the one who reigns over all people and kings <coughs> across history. He throws that little side, saying, from the first generation to the last generation, no one should even come close to comparing Cyrus with me, says the Lord, because I've handed Cyrus temporary control over a few people groups and over a few kings, but I, the Lord, have always been in control over every person and every king and will continue to be to the end. King of kings, da-da-da, da-da, and Lord of... You know, he's eternally, and he will reign forever and ever and ever. <laughs> All right. Uh, and this is cool. So he trans so God transitions for a minute. He's like, it's this cool poetic move. He's saying, I'm going to do this for Cyrus, but I'm the king. And then he gets back to judgment. First, he, he recalls, uh, in verse 5, he says, The islands have seen it in fear. The ends of the earth tremble. So what he's saying is, people come and go. Kings come and go. The land has witnessed my work. How old are the rivers? How old are the rocks? Well, they're not as old as God, but they're older than you. And he's, he's saying, he, he, he put things on, an, on a, on a long-term creation scale for many. He stepped outside of human history and said, now upon the rock 
of this venue for my sovereign actions. On earth, the islands tremble before me, and you arrogant humans don't. Y'all are bit players. Y'all are here for a... Earth has been around for how many billions of years, right? The human race has been around for about 10,000. Do the math. It's just a pulse is how long we've been here. And the things that have been here a lot longer than us tremble before God. The oceans roar before Him and then get still before Him, but the human being doesn't. He's drawing that, see that distinction between the two? And this is the human response to, again, go back to our fallen nature. This is what humans decide to do. And this is, this is, I'm going to preach this sermon real quick as if I'm a secularist and not a, a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because this is real popular preaching right now. Each helps each other. Hey! And says to his brother, Be strong. Unite. The craftsmith, what's the next word? Encourages the goldsmith. Well done. You're whistling down the marketplace. You're everybody's getting a pack on the van. You know, good time, Charlie. Hey, everybody, good weather. He goes and smooths with the hammer, spurs him on who strikes the anvil. He says, well, and this is good work. He nails down the idol so that it will not topple. Well done. Mike, you got that? I like sending Mike in places. <laughs> Verses 6 and 7 on your notes. This is not a drill. Everyone get under their table. No. Well, they don't like you anymore. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Thanks, Mike. All right. Uh, verses 6 through 7. The unregenerate say, Let us unite. And be strong, we can withstand God. We know it's a microcosm, it's an echo of what's going to take place in the Battle of Armageddon when the kings of the earth and the peoples of the earth, those who are not marked with the blood of Christ, but marked with the mark of the beast, the mark of coexist, let's be together, let's get along, let's work together between you and me. We don't need God. In fact, God's our problem at this point. We believe in God, we just hate God. Let's gather together and let's rattle our swords at the Almighty God and say, come down here that we might kill you as we killed your Christ. <laughs> the Bible. It's the human race. The unregenerate human race does not progress into righteousness. We progress into a unity against God. And redemption means that God, when He looked in His foreknowledge, saw you rattling your sword against Him. And He entered into the enemy camp and said, I want that one for me. While we were still enemies of God, He sent His Son, Jesus. So where is the boasting? It's excluded. It's echoes. Again, Ben said last week, this is the fifth gospel. There will be people who encounter the work of God as something to oppose, as something to stand against, as something to be strong against, and not something to repent toward.
But then he says, verses 8 through 10, But you, O Israel, are my servant. You, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, my beloved. So on your notes, he says, Israel is my servant, whom I chose, and of whom I love. You look up the word in Hebrew after Abraham, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. In Hebrew, it's the one I love, my beloved. And literally it means, you are people who are, dis- you are of whom I love. I love you too, but I love Abraham first. And again, Abraham is the prototype. Jesus Christ assumes Abraham, all the promises made to Abraham. For the believer in Jesus Christ, for the Gentile and the Jew who have faith in Jesus, we hear once again, you have become a descendant of Jesus, a brother to Jesus, a descendant of Abraham, through faith alone, and because I love Jesus, I love you. Abraham's my friend. Jesus is my beloved. And because you're with Jesus, yeah. What's interesting because when I heard that, I immediately hearken back to Romans 1. Those are three things that you hear. And, you know, St. Paul was a smart guy. But I, he could not have been just thinking, what did I learn in my Isaiah class back at Hebrew school? He was hearing from the same Holy Spirit. He identifies in the Spirit first words out of Romans 1 1. If you want to turn there with me, you can. First words. He identifies with the same threefold position that Isaiah speaks over the people of Israel. Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. On your notes, we put my servant whom I chose and of whom I love. That concept of who are you in Jesus, what's your role on earth, it's, it's repeated throughout Scripture that in the midst of all of God's work, while much of the world will be opposing Him, uniting to oppose Him, He has indeed redeemed and selected a people, not only for your personal benefit, but for His righteous service. In this threefold concept, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, St. Paul is speaking personal to his calling in life. Isaiah 40, he says, my, my job, my role here is to be a servant, but if you reverse them, I like the reverse order better. First and foremost, I'm loved on account of Christ. Number two, I'm chosen. Number three, now I serve. He's building in this identity into the people of Israel. When my mighty hand moves, remember, you're loved because you're loved. We talked, uh, the Reformation, Protestant Reformation uh, anniversary is coming up. Martin Luther was the one that says, God does not find, but creates that which he finds lovely. He doesn't look around and say, what's pretty? And he looks around and sees utter depravity, total depravity. He's just utter darkness. And God says, I'm going, to, I'm going to create that which I want to see. He doesn't find, but creates. He doesn't... He's not, he's not an exploration mission. He's on a redemptive mission. And he produces that which he wishes to see. And so Luther went on to say... Because we're loved, we become attractive. Not the other way around. This is a gospel. It's God saying, I chose, I chose to produce loveliness in your life because I chose to. That's the biggest mystery um, that, that, that Him, how deep the Father's love for us. People ask, why do good things? Why do bad things? Why this? Why that? The biggest question we should ask is why do we gain from Jesus' reward? And the hymn says, I cannot give an answer. 
Why should I benefit from Jesus' work? That's your mystery. And so in Isaiah 41, he's saying, in the midst of all this turmoil and power and and, and, and a response by all these people, I'm going to have a people, I'm going to have a redeemed people by my sovereign election who are loved, who are chosen, who are my servants, because I said so, because I choose to have you. And he goes on from there, he says, Look, I took you from the ends of the earth, from the farthest corners. I called you. I said, You're my servant. I have chosen you. I have not rejected you. So do not fear. I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced, and those who oppose you will be as of nothing and perish. On your notes, verse 11, Jesus would call this persecuted for righteousness. The two words that are used, if you want to define persecution, it's rage and opposition. Um, the book of Revelation is a good example. The, the dragon could not defeat the child. And so he goes after the mother. Mary's straight up called the mother of all who believe, by the way. So... Uh, Mother Mary, I don't know how that works, but I liken her unto Abraham. She was the first to be filled with the Holy Spirit in such a way that Christ himself was manifest in her life. Uh, she's the, the prototype, like Abraham was the father of faith. She's the mother. Um, I'm not Catholic, but you're pretty close on that one. Anyhow, the dragon could not defeat the child, so he goes after the mother. The mother was taken away on wings. He spewed forth water from his mouth. The, the earth opened up and swallowed the water. And the devil said, Because I could not get the son and I cannot get the mother, I will war against her children. And so this is a concept that says, Be prepared, says the Lord, in a season of God's righteous movements, not only for opposition of the human race toward God, but when they realize they can't effectively oppose God, they're going to start effectively, trying to effectively rage against and oppose those who have faith in God. That's what it means to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. For you to witness the work of God, for you to not to work against God, but to praise God, be prepared, Scripture says, for you to become the target of of rage and opposition. That's what it means. It can manifest in many ways. Jesus says rejoice. Verse uh, 13 says, For I am the Lord uh, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear. Um, a word came to me recently. I just wrote an article about it for our church newsletter. And it was... Um, I, I participate in so much uh, theological malpractice. And uh, I'm trying to get that right. That's what repentance means. Praise God. And uh, I not only have prayed this way... And I'm not against praying this way, but it, uh, there's a certain type of prayer that not only do I prioritize as the best type of prayer and teach others to do the same... And that's to pray because you're worried. Um, right? So I was hit with a word that said, no, no. Pray because you believe. Uh, it's, it's kind of a convoluted thing. I wrote an article about it, but The concept that, that our prayers are going to be designed and built around a temporary crisis. That means the way we'll pray is to, for God to deliver us and restore us to our pre-crisis state as opposed to Him being glorified in us fundamentally. We want Him to just fix one little thing right now, you know. And so, 
what we're doing is praying the prayers toward things that are going to be considered untrue in the end. The word of the Lord is forever. Everything else is going to fall apart. We're building and designing words and prayers and saying things that on the grand scheme of things aren't really connected to lasting things. And the word that I received was pray on the basis of the things God has already promised. Pray because you believe Psalm 1, blessed is the man or woman who delights in the word of the Lord and who muses, meditates, recalls those promises day and night. She will be like a tree planted near the water. That's just a word I received. Is how many times it said, I heard it says 365 times, it's one per day. Mm -hmm. Do not fear. Yeah, 360. 366, because one for leap year. Do not be dismayed. Do not be afraid. That's a consistent deal. And so, one of the things that hit me just in that word was, on your notes, uh, pray because you believe. On your next line, faith, not prayer, moves mountains. It's not your prayer. Your prayer is an expression of the faith you have. You can pray that you can you can get a hold of Peter Marshall's prayers. I got a book of them. And if you don't have faith and you pray those prayers, what does that mean? You're just doing poetry. Yeah. See? So that word hit me pretty strongly this week. I'm still digesting, trying to figure out what to do with that. But one of them is to it kind of reminds me of our worship time. It's to go in stand on the promise, standing on the promises of God, and to pray and worship out of belief. And so I went home and wrote down several of the prayers, several of the promises that are very impactful to my life. Number one, God will be glorified. He will reveal Himself in, in a weighty fashion. Uh, Jesus Christ has completely satisfied Him. Uh, number three, Jesus is the name that's authorized. I believe that. Do you believe that? The Holy Spirit is dwelling in anyone who has faith. Do you believe the Holy Spirit's already in you, even if you haven't entertained that very much? God says He'll do something. He will. It's in there. You start to stand on those promises. And you'll face difficulty and you'll need to pray. But by the time I was praying, I was already crushed. My heart was already hurt. My spirit was already hurt. And, and so that, that changes the way that you pray. You pray on the basis of the promise. You don't pray on the basis of the problem. Mike. I'm a little confused. Um, if you're not a believer, why bother to pray anyway? Mm -hmm. You're not confused. <laughs> yeah, I think I am. So that's the essence of the argument. My point would be, Quit, if you're a believer, quit praying as if you're not one. I can't. I don't know. <laughs> if, if you are a believer, quit praying as if you're not one. And, and so, I mean, that's ultimately is, what, it, what is your hope in? And that the faith of Abraham was a faith described as Abraham heard God made a promise, and Abraham believed whatever God promised, God would do. It had nothing to do with Abraham's morals, his prayer life. It had to do with faith. Well, then his prayers mattered, and they, they were more potent and, and directed. But that was a word that hit me. It's going to take a while for me to process. I'm just sharing with you now because the phrase, do not fear, has come up so many times in Isaiah chapter 41 that that's, that's strong. And that's messing with my heart. And I'm repenting because I've taught people to build a prayer life pri primarily around being incentivized by problems, not being incentivized by God's promises. You see? Thank you. And Paul, look how many times it says, I will... 
all the way down that page and park half the next page. I will. Yep. Circle. We ought to circle those. Yep. <laughs> yep. I think that's the that, that right there is the antidote. Again, I've joked before. Uh, if my wife is restless, uh, the, uh, I've learned pretty quickly the word relax doesn't really work. Um, and so instead of focusing on don't be afraid, which is the commandment, focus on the promise, on the gospel. I will. I have and I will. And uh, the, the, St. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15 that if the resurrection had not happened, everything we're talking about is in vain. And we, of all people, should be most pitied, the Christian. And he said that everything hangs on the balance of that. And, of course, there were 500 witnesses to it, saw the resurrected Christ. And so the, the, everything that we're founded upon is God made promises. God's kept all of his promises up to this point, including the massive one, which is through his son Jesus Christ to resurrect him from the dead. And God is, has made other promises that are yet to be fulfilled. And that's the basis of our religion. Is a regenerate believer has now the new ability to put weight on the promises of God. Have faith. Anyhow, I went and prayed in the sanctuary that afternoon, yesterday afternoon, and gained about six inches. <laughs> You lose a lot of weight when you're praying the promises and not the problems. Can't wait till Sunday to see how tall you are. Ooh, man. Uh, so, digest that however you will. Uh, verse 17. Uh, so verse 16b says, because he said, do not fear. Uh, verse 16b said, but you will rejoice in Yahweh and glory in the Holy One of Israel. And you're, again, my experience yesterday was having difficulty rejoicing in God because I was consistently praying problems and not praying promises. I had a hard time finding, you have a hard time finding joy when you're the laundry list guy. Again, pray however you pray. This is not a, a, uh, an attack on problem prayers. Because there are going to be times that's all you got. It's more to pray in line of God's promise. There's a specific promise he makes in verses 17 through uh, 20, and I, I don't gonna, want to get into too much, but the specific promise he decides to remind them of right now is water and beauty by God's hand. You know, it's a specific promise he makes. Sometimes specific promises are what you need. But there's been a, a consistent promise made through our church and to our church that there are rivers of water flowing in and through our sanctuary. And we had one uh, too recently where someone was hearing the water flow in the chapel and finally turned to their husband and said, can you hear that? And then he's all like, ah! you know, they're trying to hear and it's, you know, it doesn't know how that works. Um, but we've had, we had somebody uh, recently uh, have an experience, a dream, very clear. Um, and they're from people that don't talk. They're from all different parts of the church where there were angelic kind of ancient beings, um, wise beings, talking to me and Ismo. And uh, we called this person over and told her, uh, listen, you're, you are, we're going to need you to get down on your knees and pull up a tile, uh, one of the wooden tiles. And her, her response was, shouldn't Ismo do that? I mean, he's a property guy. He knows what he's doing. And I said, no, no, you're authorized to do it. We need you to do it. There's a treasure under there for you. She pulls it up, and there's just an abyss. Nothing. I mean, nothing. Uh, and so I said, oh, whoa, whoa. Go up three, and then to the right, two. And as she got down and started peeling it up, and she woke up. Well, she didn't know how many dreams we've had with, with water, you see. So, biblical... Explicitly stated, communally discerned, whatever that is. There are times you've got to just say, I believe what God's been telling us. And in this case, he, in, his, in his timing, he decided to remind them of a promise. 
that he's a God that can provide water. He's a God that will provide life. Of course, that's universally experienced in Revelation 20, the tree of life, with the river flowing out from underneath it, and countless people are coming to the tree. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations. So we see these promises keep coming. It's all biblical, but sometimes those promises have to go from a, a lofty truth to a specific reality for a people. And that's the hard part. Most people don't think it could happen to you. That God's promise would come to you. Uh, verses 21 through 24, uh, this is where he gets to the final judgment uh, of these idols. Um, on your notes, God judges idols and their followers. Um, he, he's, you know, come on in. Of course, there's idols, so he's talking to pieces of furniture. Set forth your, your arguments. I'll listen. Bring your idols to tell us what's going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that we can consider them and know their final outcome. Tell us your predictions and then... Oh, there's nothing you can't talk. Okay, well, how about you tell me uh, things that might happen next? And well, nothing, okay. Well, uh, um, okay, do something. Just do something, whatever. Uh, this was, again, the prophets of Baal. They cut themselves, and, and it, was, it was really what God's responsible. Which of the deities is res able to respond? And clearly the Baals did. The God of Baal didn't respond at all, and Yahweh did, and came down with a fire and ate up all the, you know, lapped up all the water. Do something, no? Uh, okay, here's my judgment. Here's my verdict. You're less than nothing. You're worse than something that is, is not even in existence. Now, you're not just worthless. You're negative worth. You owe us something. You owe us for the space you've taken up. You owe us for the lies you've sown. You're worse than nothing. Wow, you're starting to get close to a definition of hell, aren't you? Now, just cease to exist, but you're, you've done damage. You are, you are a rip in the fabric of my creation. You are a bad thing. You're worse than nothing. And those who choose you are detestable. i got to run. It's John Piper, a quote underneath there, is our greatest disease is preferring other things to God. These idols, these false religions, these false doctrines are not just false, but they've taken people away from God. They've taken people away from the promises of God. So he's just saying, you're worse, it would be better if you never were here. That's how bad you are. You're irredeemable. Verse 41, 25 through 29, um, God says, we don't have time to read it, but God will act. He asked them, who of you predicted it? Of course, there's utter silence. In verse 29, I've rewritten it into English. And He says on your notes, Behold, all other gods and their promises are trouble because they are empty. Excuse me, what's that? Empty. empty. Then he says, their images slash, and the images literally means their coverings. So, a doctrine will always be packaged in a certain way and presented to you. Pelagianism last time. Different covering, same lie. Their covering only confuses, this is great, our spirits. Confuses our spirits. In, 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 the, in the English it put, for some reason, their images are but wind and confusion. In the Hebrew it's ruach, which says our spirits enter into confusion when you're around those things. It's like a mat. you're trying to use a compass and someone keeps bringing a magnet near it. <laughs> Get it out of here. You're worse than nothing. Like, if you were holding empty air, that would be better than holding that magnet, you see. 
And so he's saying their coverings are a confusion to the human spirit. And this just says your pastor, because of this, come out of agreement with their existence and their promises. All of the things that God, that the false gods say and say, they're, they're trouble because their promises are empty. They, they're presented in a certain way. Their presentation puts your spirit in confusion. Come out of, just go ahead and say, they are worse than nothing. I'm going to shake the dust off my feet. Act like I've never been around that. That's never been part of my life. Talk to God about coming out of agreement with these false things. And definitely not build a life upon them. This was the word of Isaiah to the people of Israel living in Babylon, awaiting the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40. I love you. You're mine. This world is against me. The idols are worthless and people worship them. They give false promises. But I the, God, I, the Lord of everything, have placed judgment on them. Live accordingly. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that your spirit would continue to move your word deep within us and that we could see and know, that we could taste what it is to have a doctrinal truth become real, for us to, to have an encounter with you, a, a, an encounter with your holy word, with a signs of wonders and power, of a dreams that reiterate the truth of the gospel found in scripture. We pray this hour, in addition to that, that you would cast away and take away anything in our hearts that's associated with a false promise. Something we've built upon, we didn't recognize it, something we, we continue to hope for and look in that's not from you, that will ultimately break our heart, disappoint, and drive our spirit into confusion. We thank you for this simplification, for this washing and forgiveness, and this repentance, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name that you and your promises would be everything because you and your promises are eternal. We thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.